This is Gene Krebs. Hi there. And we're high on Ohio. On behalf of the Center for Community Solutions, we're high on Ohio. We're going around this great state. We're talking to people who know how things work and who are making a profound difference in Ohio, Ohio works. It's my great pleasure to be with Eve Stratton today, uh, former Franklin County judge, former Supreme Court justice, who has, by any one of a standard, number of standards, has made a tremendous difference in Ohio. And I really appreciate you taking the time. One of the things that when we talk to the youth, the youth are baffled as to how do people of power and influence get to be where they are. Could you give us a short little synopsis of how you fetched up here and everything? I'll be happy to, but my story has to start back way, 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 way back. Okay. Uh, I am actually a daughter of mi American missionaries to Thailand. And my mom and dad decided to go to Thailand way when they were back in college. My father was in the military, and he became a Christian while he was in the military, was involved with some missionaries at the New Hebrides Islands, where he was stationed during World War II. Okay. And then my mother was in the Salvation Army as a kid, and she wanted to be a missionary, so they met at Bible school. My dad was a Minnesota farm boy. My mom was a New York City girl. They met at Bible school, and our mission said you had to be pastors for two years mm -hmm. under the theory that if you didn't make it as a pastor, you weren't going to mm -hmm. make it as a missionary. Which denomination was this? It was called Christian and Missionary Alliance, okay. often known as the CMA or the Alliance here. Okay. So they sent them to a church in Prattville, Alabama, okay. and my dad made $50 a week. Okay. Well, they were required to raise $1,000 for their passage to Thailand, and that's a lot of money on 50 a week, so yeah. my dad worked as the church pastor. My mom was a great prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. She prayed God would send the money. One day, the couple ca he came home. He had a check from a couple in Ohio, okay. Toledo, Ohio, that sent him a check for $1,000, having uh -huh. no idea they would have a daughter who would one day come to Ohio and become a justice uh -huh. with no connection. Uh -huh. So I ended up being born in Thailand, lived uh -huh. my first 18 years, except for uh, uh, every five years we got a furlough to America. Mm -hmm. Went to a boarding school in South Vietnam mm -hmm. during the height of the Vietnam War. The school had to evacuate and move to Malaysia, so I finished up in Malaysia. Came back to America when I was 18, mm -hmm. $500, didn't know a soul. So I like to say to kids out there, you can make it in America. Oh, you can definitely do it. Whatever you want to do. My first job was at McDonald's. You went to law school. You were the first, if I remember correctly, first elected woman judge in Franklin County. Yes, yes. That, was, uh, that wasn't that long ago. That was 25 years ago. Yeah. But uh, no, I was. Uh, there were six of us elected at the same time. I was the first woman elected, and it was, it was a challenge because it was very much a man's world when I started, and uh, uh, a lot of the old boys club stuff. And I just tried to do the best job I could, and okay. somehow must have done it right. Supreme Court Justice, and now one of the things I know that really is one of your passions is the, um, uh, the role of mental health in the criminal justice system. And for most people, this they, when I mention this to Bobby and Betty Buckeye, they kind of go, how are the two related? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's an very evident to me how they're related. But could you explain? Yeah. In the 1950s, we had about 500,000 people in, in uh, mental health hospitals. Terrible conditions. In America? In America. Okay. Terrible conditions. You've seen some movies about the old hospitals. There was this very good social movement that let's close these hospitals down, put them in the community, least restrictive environment. Yeah. If we had the same ratio today of people to population, we would have about 900,000 in hospitals. Instead, we have left about 70,000 nationwide. The majority of the hospitals have closed, okay. and the problem was we never created that net. We never created that community system. So they went under the bridge, they went in homeless shelters, they ended up in jail and Why prison. Why didn't we? Political will? You closed the hospitals, you saved all that money, they you put go it somewhere it on, else. Oh. They built these community, the few community shelters they built, they expected people to show up. Well, somebody who thinks they have a mental, or has a mental illness, not doesn't come. No. Isn't going to show up. And, and so they ended up in jails and prisons. Ohio, the Ohio prison system is the largest mental health facility in Ohio. So this has had a huge impact on the whole criminal justice system. Um, you've dealt with this. You were an early uh, adapter of special dockets and everything. Yes. Did you get a lot of pushback? Explain, for first of all, what is a special docket, and 
why did why did anybody ever oppose you on what sounds like a, such a common sense Actually, suggestion? Actually, they really didn't. What happened is Chief Justice Moyer, our mm -hmm. Chief Justice at the time, mm -hmm. had been very good in pushing drug courts, okay. which is a different way of dealing with people. And so when I came along, I helped establish mental health courts. Okay. And the difference is in a regular docket, you have somebody come in, they have a serious mental illness, they're maybe not sick enough that they're incompetent, they can still be convicted, mm -hmm. but the reason they are there is because they are self-medicating with a a alcohol and drugs, they've never been diagnosed, they're living right. under a bridge, they're stealing for food. Right. And in a regular docket you say, okay, I'm gonna put you on probation and I want you to go get mental health treatment and you need to get a job and you need to get a house and you should get drug and alcohol treatment. Mm -hmm. and they'll never go to the first place, they'll go under a bridge again. Okay. And then they're arrested again and they cycle in and out. And, in and all out. Of this just clogs up the courts mm -hmm. and costs the average taxpayer, citizen of Ohio, a huge amount of money. Do you have any idea how much were you I looking? can't really, I'd have to have all those figures in front of me, but about 10 or 15% of the most seriously mentally ill consume about 70% of those resources Whoa, in you, all the systems. Can you say in that again? About 15, 10 to 15% of the most seriously mentally ill consume about 70% of the resources because they're picked up, they take uh, shelter space, uh -huh. they take emergency room space. Uh, taking care of somebody in a supportive housing environment where you support them with housing costs us about $50 a day. Uh -huh. uh, 30, I'm sorry, $30 a day. A jail or prison bed costs about $60 to $80 a day. A hospital bed costs uh -huh. $1,500 a day. So when they're picked up and put into a hospital for two or three days, you can, imagine, you can keep them for a long time in a, a supportive housing. Yeah. So the goal of the mental health court is, instead of saying you're gonna to go to all these systems, which they'll never go to, mm -hmm. the judge is like a team leader, brings in mental health, brings mm -hmm. in drug and health, brings mm -hmm. in the housing and said, okay, the first thing we gotta do is get this person a house. Mm -hmm. We gotta get them shelter, because if we don't, they're gonna end up back under the bridge, doesn't matter how much mental health treatment we give them. And they treat it as a team and they support this person with what they need to succeed and it's not a soft on crime, it's a smart on crime, because they have to be in this program for usually two years, mm -hmm. whereas they could serve their three weeks be out back on the street. So this has, so this, this you're, you're hit, what you're hitting upon is what I call the unified field theory of public policy development. There are certain things that have a huge impact on other aspects of public policy, mm -hmm. tax policy, expenditures, the whole structure of Ohio. And what, what you're saying is that if we can get a better grip and a better handle on this one issue, mm -hmm. it could, in the case of, of case of the police, they could spend their time investigating true crimes. Yes. Um, so next year, in the, this, we're filming this in January here of 14. Uh, Nick, about one year from now, we're going to have a new state budget, perhaps being getting ready mm -hmm. to be introduced. If you could ask one thing for that next budget to include that would be helpful for this problem that we've been talking about here, what would it be? If you were willing to put a lot more money into treatment, mm -hmm. then that treatment, getting to people before they reach crisis, mm -hmm. before they commit a crime, before mm -hmm. they end up homeless, before they're mm -hmm. picked up and put in very expensive hospitals, mm -hmm. if you could devote a lot more resources to prevention mm -hmm. and dealing with the mental illness before it gets to the crisis proportion, all those other budgets go down. Yeah. All how, those other budgets have savings. How, how, much, how much are we talking about here, do I you think? I can't even tell you how much it would be. Okay. I just know that it would be, some of it could just be a real reallocation of resources, because yeah. if you do that, you on the front end, you reduce your costs on the deep end. You're really talking about a really positive return on investment here for the citizens. And, Absolutely. And, you know, this is one of those things is that, so it's, you know, and these were the types of things when, when I served in General Assembly, for whatever reason, these types of conversations never occurred about return on investment. Mm -hmm. It was very punitive. Um, um, you know, I sponsored the three strikes in your out bill. And then I find out that when most of these, well, a lot of these habitual criminals turn 45, like a switch goes off mm -hmm. in many cases. And, and they stop committing crimes. Yeah, and yeah. they just kind of, they, ca they calm down, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm going, oh. So you're, what you're saying here has a huge implication. Um, we have a population of about 
51,000 right now. Mm -hmm. About 30,000 of the 51,000 are low-level offenses that are in there for one year or less. Mm -hmm. So we are churning 30,000 prisoners who are in there too short to get treatment, too short to get programming, too short to get any real assistance. Mm -hmm. We churn them back out, put them back in the community with no supports. If we reinvest that money, it costs mm -hmm. 25,000 a year for one person. If we reinvest that money that we were spending on them, housing them in a prison yeah. into community resources, then you've got taxpayers, they're paying taxes, child support, they're doing community service. It is a much more positive return. So, yeah, so I see it's an effect here, you know, kind of going through our agenda. Under myth busting, what you're saying is that when, when, when we went away from the previous structure to the new structure, we never adapted. No. And so then related question to that is, what of all this, all this, this keeps you up at night then, I think, then doesn't it? You're very passionate about it. This keeps you <laughs> up at night. It doesn't keep me up at night. I'm just a doer. I, I don't want to study things. There's lots of studies out there. I want action. Okay. So anytime I put a committee together, anytime I put a group together, the joke is kind of you don't want to hit, hook up with Stratton because she'll give you homework. You know, okay. we get things done. And that's what we've done in Ohio. We have been very, 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 very much on the forefront in Crisis intervention training, which is training for uh, law uh, for police officers. We're doing some right things then. We are absolutely leading the country in that. We have the most specialized dockets in the country. We have over 155. Okay. Of all types, mental health, drug, alcohol, DUI, okay. uh, mental health, veterans. I'm doing a lot of work with veterans. I could spend another well, whole session on veterans. Well, just real quick, the problem with veterans and veterans all Veterans are coming out of these, especially these last two wars, but even going all the way back to Vietnam and even right. earlier. PTSD, traumatic, traumatic right. brain injury, post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. high suicide rates, can't mm -hmm. re adapt when they come back, self-medicate, yeah. end up in the criminal justice system. And I've done a lot of work in the veterans' mm -hmm. issues in the last five years. You know, we've come a long way since General George Patton slapped a soldier and, and called him a, a malingerer and a coward, haven't we? We have. We've realized not war, and maybe it's that, that war has become a more horrible thing than it was in the 1650s. Well, there's two problems. One is the type of wars we have now. We're sending them more frequently, longer deployments, yeah. so the trauma's worse. The IED explosions are creating traumatic brain injury. We only have recently begun to recognize it, even in football players. Yes. And there's still this culture of tough, macho, I don't need help, uh, I'm not going to need to seek help, but they suffer alone, and we made them that way. They yeah. did. They became this because they were serving our country. So we have an extra duty to take care of them, in my opinion. This has been Gene Krebs with uh, Eve Stratton, and uh, we've had a delightful conversation. And you have one, shall we say, epilogue to all this discussion here. Yes, yes. I like to tell. I like to try to explain to people why I left the Supreme Court so that I can work on these issues more fully, because that was kind of a shock to people, because I could have been a justice for many more years. But it was something that meant a lot to me. And, and when you look at my missionary background, it kind of informs why I'm doing this. But when I was in private practice, I did a lot of wills and estate planning for people in my church. And I had a little old lady named Ethel Morris that had a will that she needed done. And then she came in one day, and she was very distressed. And I said, Ethel, what is wrong? And she said, I have a sister named Violet Moon. And she's got this brain condition, and she has to have surgery. But they canceled her insurance. And we don't know what we're going to do. So I said, well, let me, let me check this out. So I talked to the doctor, and I found out that short-term memory loss was a true medical side effect of her brain condition. Well, the doctor was willing to write a letter attesting to that. The hospital said that if we paid the back premiums, or the insurance company said if we paid the back premiums, they would reinstate her insurance. So we did. She was able to go forward, have her surgery, and it was very successful. When my mom and dad were coming to visit, they were on furlough. And they usually stay in Florida, so they were coming up to Ohio, and everybody from my church wants to meet my missionary parents. Uh -huh. So I called up Ethel Morris and said, my mom and dad are coming. Can you get a hold of Violet Moon and be sure to come and meet them? So she called up Violet and said, Eve Stratton's parents are coming to church on Sunday. Can you come with me? And Violet said, I love missionaries. I know a lot of them. What are their names? I said, their names are Kareen and Elmer Salberg. That was my maiden name. Mm -hmm. And there was this pause, and Violet said, you know, that's very strange. Because 35 years ago, my husband and I gave $1,000 to a Karina and Elmer Salberg to go to Thailand. Mm -hmm. I had no idea there was a violet moon in my life. Yeah. So I happen to think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I can see that. And I will f fully confess to the people viewing this, I've 
heard this from you now at least a dozen times. Every time I tear up. Oh, it's a very special story that gives me chills even to tell it. Stuff. I got it. it yeah. Um, well, this has been Gene Krebs, and on behalf of the Center for Community Solutions, we're high in Ohio. Thank you for tuning in this week, and tune in next week. For more about the Center for Community Solutions or their publications, please visit www.communitysolutions.com.